William Bill R. Crow, United States Marine Corps, Korea. I had the pleasure and opportunity and honor of interviewing Bill Crow in Wichita, Kansas, January 12, 2006. And what a story he tells folks. Bill enlisted into the military as a young teenager and fought in Peleliu and Okinawa in World War II with the 1st Marine Division. He was called back during Korea, fought at the Chosen Reservoir, has an amazing story to tell. He served with the 7th Regiment, 1st Marine Division as a corporal and then as a sergeant in the Chosen Reservoir. And what a story Bill has to tell. So I'm happy to share this story with you today. And folks, I tell you what, these stories are precious. These stories, I think, are like a fine wine. They get better with time. And I want to encourage you to, to get behind these stories and help support sponsor and or donate to the work that I'm doing. I've done over 20 years of work. I've interviewed veterans across North America and parts of the world, over a thousand stories. And when I interviewed these veterans originally, I interviewed them to put, feature them in my documentaries, which I've done with a lot of them. And I didn't think I would ever share their complete unedited, raw, emotional stories with the, the world, but that's what I'm doing. And people are, are enjoying it and getting touched and blessed and learning so much about our country. As teachers have told me, history is best learned from those who are there. These are the first-hand accounts, folks. These are the people, the men and women that were there, and these are the stories that count. So I would encourage you to become a sponsor. There's information in the video description or donate to this work. It's a labor of love, folks. It really is. It has an incredible journey. I call it a labor of love. There's information in the comment section on donating. Or you can go to LarryCapetto.com, my website, and there's information there. But you know, Bill's story, it's incredible. His faithful and humble service to our country is an enduring example of his patriotism and his love of country. And folks, this story needs to be told and I'm so glad that we're able to do it. I want to thank Brandon Glidden for sponsoring Bill's story today, making it possible for you to hear and to see it in its entirety. Okay, folks, without further ado, freedom's not free. We know we're fighting for the same freedoms in our own country that our veterans fought for on foreign soil. It's so important to these veterans that we keep our freedoms, that we don't lose our freedoms, that we're not easily duped or cheated out of our freedoms, folks. There's a lot of tyranny today. I don't usually share these things in these messages, but folks, we got to stand strong today and stand up and fight for our veterans. Many of you have loved ones in your family that have served this country or are serving right now. We salute you and thank you for it. So share these videos, subscribe to this channel. Let's keep this thing going, folks. Say God bless you and just have a great day. And thank you for listening to Bill Crow's story. I was with 7th Regiment and uh, with uh, communications in 7th Regiment. And what was your official title? Uh, at that time, Message Center. Okay. So if I put your name, your title would be Message Center or would it be Communications? Communications, okay. yeah. And how about your rank? I, at, in The Chosen, I was a corporal, okay. but I made sergeant after that. Okay. Well, let's just talk a little bit about Korea. Just give me a, a real quick synopsis of why we, were, we even had to go to Korea. Why, right. why did we get involved over there? Well, the main reason I'm here is because I have a very strong feeling that the reason I am here is because there's a lot of people that aren't. Uh, we lost a lot of people, particularly up at the Chosen. Uh, we made the landing in Incheon, and Mr. MacArthur engineered that and uh, had some people going against him, but uh, it came off and uh, was a very good stroke of luck because it cut, cut the North Koreans off that were in South Korea and allowed uh, the troops that were, had been pinned down in the south part of Korea for so long, allowed them to move up. And we moved across about at the 38th parallel. Uh, we got to a place around Uijongbu, I think, is about as far east as we got. 
And then Mr. MacArthur decided that uh, the 1st Marine Division should go land in North Korea. So he pulled us out, put us on ships. We went down around the peninsula, come up, and we were to land at Wonsan. But Wonsan was a port that had been very heavily mined. So we were on these ships, and they were running these ships back and forth and back and forth until they got the mines cleaned out. By the time they got the mines cleaned out, while well, a lot of the army troops from the south had already come up into Wonsan. So our next project was to go into North Korea from Wonsan and then start up this main supply route, MSR we call it, where it led up directly up to the Yalu River. This was Mr. MacArthur's mistake. It was a very serious mistake. Uh, it was a single road all the way up there. There were no two roads. There was a single road, and in places it was uh, capable to handle only one vehicle. It was a perfect place for ambush. Uh, and as we progressed north, we didn't run into a lot of opposition until we began to run into some cold weather, uh, began getting into snow, and of course the higher elevations, it got colder. But uh, then we uh, were supposed to be chasing the North Koreans that were fleeing South Korea. We were to chase them up, and Mr. MacArthur had the idea that he would reunite North and South Korea, which had been divided since World War II between the Communists and the United States. That was a mistake. As we moved north on the MC MSR, we began to pick up Chinese prisoners. Uh, and oftentimes the Chinese prisoners, the Chinese soldiers, had a good idea of what their military intentions were. But as we progressed on up north, uh, we picked up some prisoners and began to get information that there was lots of Chinese over here, there were lots of Chinese over here. Uh, that was communicated back to General Almond, who was head of 10th Corps, and to MacArthur, and they said, well, this is just a few uh, volunteers from China that have come down to help the North Koreans. It's nothing important, but of course the Chinese had threatened to come into the war if we went north of the 38th parallel. We went north of the 38th parallel and that's when we started getting into trouble. Uh, we had the first division was strung out from <clears throat> Sudan uh, up to Kotori, up to Hagaru, and on up to Udam Ni, <clears throat> which was on the west side of the reservoir. And there was, a, there was about three battalions of the 7th Army that was over on the east side of the reservoir. But they told us, they had given us orders to just proceed right on up to the Yalu River. Uh, and of course we couldn't get air support north of the Yalu because of the, that was China. I, anyway, we got as far, that is, the 5th and 7th regiments got as far as you damn knee. The 1st regiment and elements of the army and so forth were left at, at Hagaru, Kotori, and uh, Chinahongni. I, I, that isn't right. Well, anyway, another. What it amounted to, we had about four or five bases up along there that was supposed to protect the main supply route. But when we got up to Udam Ni, General Smith, who was our commanding general, realized that we were in a very precarious position. We, we had an 80 mile stretch that was wide open on our left flank over to where the 8th Army was at, which was clear over on the west side of the peninsula. So that was all wide open. On the other side, of course, this 7th Army group was over there. But it was right at the end of November that 
the Chinese came out in force. Uh, but in the meantime, they kept saying, no, the Chinese aren't going to come in. They're not coming in. Well, they came in, uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Uh, we received orders to hold up there as long as we could, for two days anyway, uh, so that the 8th Army on the west bank, or the west part of the peninsula, could begin to evacuate back. And we did. We held up there. Uh, but we'd actually, General Smith had given uh, our, our commanding officer, Litzenberg, and Colonel Murray, who had had the 5th Regiment, had given them orders to kind of drag their feet because he realized we were getting in a bad position. And at the same time, he uh, flew back into Hagaruri and insisted that they start making the airstrip in Hagaru because there was no airstrip anywhere along there. And he began to realize we were in serious trouble and would need uh, some kind of uh, way of getting people in or people out or ammunition in and so forth. But when the Chinese finally hit us, they, uh, it, we took a terrible amount of casualties. Uh, and anyway, the, after about two days, they decided the only thing to do was start to move back. But in the meantime, the Chinese had come in and literally surrounded each one of these perimeters. Yu Dam Ni was surrounded, the next step down was uh, Hagaruri, they were surrounded. Next one down was Kotori, it was surrounded. Then there was Sidong, Sudong, and it was surrounded. And there was also a battalion of British Marines who were at, uh, I believe they were at Sudong. And after this happened, then the British Marines and elements of the 1st Regiment tried to open the road from Sudong up to Kotori and they were shot up real bad. Uh, there was only part of them made it into Coterie. Uh, part of them were straggled out all the way along the route because the Chinese had come in and managed to cut it up. But their idea was to try and consolidate things to where we could get back down that main supply route. But as we began to move out, then they we would use one, one regiment would move forward, the other one would take the rear, and we would move down. But basically, everything had to go down that main supply route. Our vehicles had no other way to go. And it was, would have been impossible for them to climb over the mountains and try to come out that way. The army group that was over on the east side of the Chosen were practically annihilated. They had a convoy started out that they had loaded with wounded and so forth. They made it out onto the ice on the reservoir, but that's as far as they got. And the Chinese had a roadblock set. They uh, stopped the convoy and literally wiped them out. Now there was quite a number of stragglers from there that did go over the mountains and straggled into Hagaruri into the perimeter there, but there were very few of them. And as we started to move out, uh, the first place that we needed to go was to relieve, there was Fox Company uh, of the 7th Regiment, had been put out on, uh, Tok, I think it was Tok Tong Pass, uh, we call it Fox Hill, <laughs> after Fox Company had been there so long. But they were holding this pass because it was a very important pass to get this main supply route moving. And they set out there and held that. So that was our first objective as we moved out to relieve them. And we relieved them. It was at night. And uh, as they came down, of course, we were loading. Uh, the trucks were carrying wounded only. Uh, some of the trucks were loaded with dead, just stacked like cordwood. We were trying to bring out everybody and everything that we could. But prior to leaving you, Damney, a captain came to us and he said, if you can't carry it and run, burn it. Burn it, destroy it, 
get rid of it. So that was done there. But as we come out, of course, all the way along, uh, it seemed like about every bend in the road, the Chinese had roadblocks and they were firing down on the, on the train as we, as we tried to move down the main supply route. So consequently, we had, uh, it was about 80 miles from Udamni down to Hung Nam, where we eventually evacuated out. But as we were moving down, occasionally the train would come under fire and line companies would have to go out and secure the perimeter, drive them back until we could get the train moving again. And oftentimes the train would get cut. It would, it would be, have a break in it. And the one part of the train would be moving down the line, the other one would be held up. Uh, and of course, it was bitterly cold. We had nights that got down to 30 below. Uh, we had parkas, we had gloves, but our, the biggest problem was our shoe packs. We had what they call shoe packs, but they were, they were not uh, uh, ventilated. And in order to keep from freezing to death, you literally had to keep moving. You, you didn't stop, you just had to keep moving. And as you moved, your feet would sweat. And then if you stopped, it made ice. And that's how so many uh, people got frostbite, on their, particularly on their feet. Uh, some of them much worse than others. But one consolation perhaps is that the Chinese were worse off than we were in some of their equipment and clothing. Uh, they were moving pretty well just out in the hills and over the mountains. And uh, I know at one time, well, it's several days after that, but we had picked up a couple of prisoners and they were just walking along with us. But both of these men, their legs were black, clear up to their knees, just literally black, as, as black as that camera. And it was nothing but frostbite. And uh, I saw them for, I don't know, maybe an hour or two hours. I have no idea what ever become of them. I'm sure that they died up there. But as we, as we began to move out, uh, a lot of it, a lot of things took place at night, and it was, you know, it was just a, a madhouse. Um, I know at one at one point, <laughs> the the convoy started to move. We got up out of the ditches and and began to run. You run down the road, and I turned around. And there's a Chinaman running right behind me. And the Marine in back of me, he grabbed him and he threw him down in the snow. He says, what are you doing here, you so-and-so? And bang, bang, he shot him. And to this day, I don't know if that Chinaman had a weapon, if he didn't have a weapon or anything else. Uh, all I was going to do was run. You know, you, when you got a break to where you could move south on that road, you move south one way or another. But... We relieved, we finally got to where we relieved Fox Company, which was really the first step. Uh, and I remember as we come down through there and picked them up, a lot of their wounded were walking wounded. And uh, I walked for a little while with a fellow that had been shot right through the mouth, just shot just like this through the mouth. But uh, of course he was not riding, he was, he was walking out, which was good because oftentimes if wounded could not keep moving, they would freeze to death. And so our next, uh, at, at some point beyond there, I got separated from my unit at all. And I had no idea where they were or anything. This was at night and, and uh, things were just pretty chaotic. But as we moved on down, uh, eventually we got into the area where the Hagaru perimeter was at. And they had uh, Colonel Puller, who had the 1st Regiment, who I served with. He was my regimental commander in World War II. But he had the 1st Regiment there. And at Hagaru, they had set up a bunch of warming tents in the perimeter and uh, had people set out on the road helping guide our column in as we came in. But one of the last things I remember before we got into that perimeter was 
there was a tank sitting right beside the road, and we had to run right in front of that tank in order to get by it. And you made a perfect silhouette, but they had a, uh, a uh, I'm assuming he was an MP or something, but he was standing there kind of trying to direct people through there because we were being shot at as we went. And as I took off and started to run past that tank, I slipped on the ice and my rifle went this way and my helmet went that way. <laughs> and I run over, grabbed my rifle and forgot the helmet and got on past that tank. But we went into the perimeter and they told us just find a warming tent, get in a warming tent and, and see what you can get some rest. I went into the first tent I saw and it was pretty well filled up, but there was room on the ground or they had oil burning stoves in the middle of these warming tents. But I, right next to that stove, I curled up there, and I, I don't know, I must have slept 10 hours, I suppose, or 12 hours maybe. Uh, when I woke up, why well, I got up and, and I thought, well, I better go try and find the people I'm supposed to be with. And as I went out, I got word that they'd they had had a big, great big supply of hot cake mix that was, had been airdropped in there. And they had set this big tent up and they were doing nothing except cooking hot cakes just as fast as they could cook them. And the line was just going just like this to get these hot cakes. And that was the first hot food we'd had in a long, long time. Uh, well, it was probably the first food we'd had in a long time. You just you could get uh, sea rations thawed out enough to eat them uh, unless you could build a fire and get around the fire and that was not a good idea. But I made several trips through that hot cake line and then found my unit again. And of course by then why it was time to start to move down to the next area which was Coterie. Uh, and we, we ran into a terrible amount of uh, uh, resistance south of Hagaru and before we got into Coterie. I, I can't remember how long that took, but at one point uh, our S2, our whole S2 unit was Captain France and Lieutenant McGinnis uh, and uh, my Captain uh, Zawaski, but our S2 unit was literally wiped out coming out and they're the ones that had a lot of this information that we'd tried to say, look, the Chinese are in here, you know. Uh, but then it became common knowledge after that, so it, I don't suppose it made much difference. But uh, my captain was machine gunning through both legs coming out of there. And, uh, but eventually we got down to Coterie. And by then, the trucks were so full of wounded and dead and walking wounded, walking with us, that uh, at Coterie they had a mass burial. They had another area set up where we could get into some warming tents and before we continued on south. Uh, but they had a mass burial. I, I don't recall how many bodies, but I, I can still see the bodies coming off the trucks, frozen into all kinds of positions and so forth, and, and they bulldozed a, a uh, big hole out and, and buried them in a mass grave. Uh, of course, there was a lot of our people, a lot of bodies who were never recovered. A lot of our people, uh, and the, the sad part of it was the first thing that had happened to them when the Chinese got to them, they'd strip them of their clothes and their boots and everything else, you know, because they wanted, they wanted that clothing and those boots. But, uh, they unloaded the trucks so they'd have room for more wounded. But also at Hagaru, the airstrip, uh, I forgot about, they had made that airstrip and they were bringing C-47s in and they flew out, I, I don't know how many wounded, but they made trip after trip after trip. They brought supplies and, and some, some replacements in. They brought ammunition and gasoline and things in and then they would fly the excuse me, wounded out. They did fly out some of the dead, but basically what they were flying out was the wounded. Uh, 
But once we got past Coterie, then things began to taper off a little bit. <coughs> and we, <clears throat> uh, to make a long story short, we, we eventually got down out of the mountains. And my, it was just like walking out into the summertime almost, you know, to get out of that cold. But uh, then they, we finally arrived down in the port of Hung Nam and were loaded aboard ships, evacuated out to Pusan. I found myself being real bitter after, well, I stayed there. I was in Korea uh, about a year. And uh, when I come home, I, I just, I couldn't believe that uh, a country with our potential and our power could let group people get into that kind of a situation. And yet, I know military make mistakes. They, they were made World War II, they were made in every war that's ever been fought um, in Vietnam and places like that. I just, I, I found myself watching reports from Vietnam and feeling so sorry for those kids. And, uh, and now I look at, at our people in Iraq and, and I think they're, they're just targets over there. And I, I just, it's really, it upsets me. It really upsets me. I, I just... When, when you came home, what kind of reception did you get? I had no problems. I had no problems. I, I was interrupted. I, I had gone to college for three years when I was called up. And uh, I came back, finished my college. Uh, of course, I was married and had a child and had another child. And, uh, we were received well, no, nothing like some of these Vietnam vets said. I, and I never saw any of that, but I assume it must have happened uh, or they wouldn't be saying things like that. But I know the anti-war sentiment was terrible for that kind of a <coughs> fiasco. Well, Bill, when, <coughs> when you were in Korea, now how old are you now? I'm 78. Okay, so you were... Early twenties in Korea. Yes. Okay. Are you? Are you? You consider yourself a religious type person? Yes. With faith in God, do you ever find yourself praying to God during those times, or praying for the other guys? One of the one of the best friends I had in Korea was our chaplain, Chaplain Craven, uh, was a prince prince of a man. I, I thought the world and all of him. We had the reason we became well acquainted. He, his mother-in-law lived in Wichita, and he spent quite a bit of time in Wichita. But after we were evacuated out down to Pusan, uh, I was there. We were there for Christmas Eve service. In some place, he had found a little pump organ, and uh, we had a Christmas Eve service, and he knew that I <clears throat> played at the piano. So I played the piano for the, or the organ, the little pump organ for Christmas Eve service. And shortly after that, they sent me to the hospital at, at, at Mason. I had frostbite and pleurisy and a badly infected tooth. <laughs> but uh, he left the regiment shortly after that. But when he came to Wichita, he went to the trouble of looking up my wife and daughter and my parents and went to visit them. And I thought, here was a full commander. He was a full commander, a chaplain, who would take the time to do that. And lo and behold, it's been maybe 12 years ago, I get a telephone call one day, and it's him. He was in Wichita, and he called me and wanted me to come down and visit with him for a while. And he was just a prince of a guy. Uh, our, he was our Protestant chaplain. There was a Catholic chaplain, Chaplain Griffin, who I didn't know as well, of course. But <clears throat> I knew his assistant, uh, Caruso was his name. And Caruso was killed and Griffin was wounded when they were giving aid to uh, some wounded in an ambulance on the way out of the reservoir. Uh, uh, Griffin said that Caruso really saved his life. He said he 
threw him, literally threw himself over Griffin and you, saved him. Was that your first time in combat at the Chosen Reservoir and all that? Was that your first time? No, no. no. I was on Peleliu, World War II, and Okinawa. And so I, you were, were the men looking up to you in any aspect? I mean, you'd been around? I was before. Mother Crow. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, uh, they were often getting after me because I was after them so much to try and keep straight and do things right. <clears throat> I had one, one kid that, uh, when we were coming out, somehow <clears throat> he got over between a Jeep and a trailer and was sitting on the hitch and had gone to sleep. And I spotted him over there and I went over to get him moving. And I like never got him awake. He was just very close to, of course, when you freeze to death, that's what you do is go. But uh, I run him up and down the road and up and down the road and hit him and everything else to get him woke back up and keep him moving. But he liked to run me crazy after that. He, he swore I saved his life and <laughs> he couldn't do enough for me. I, I can't imagine being that cold. I go outside, it's 32 degrees, and I want to go back inside. And you guys were below zero with oh, the, yeah. the snow. Yeah. I mean, is, is there a survival instinct that kicks in, maybe? Or your training, well, or your faith? Or what, what keeps you going, you're, man? <clears throat> One thing, you're scared. You know, you're, you're scared. The adrenaline's running. And, uh, I can... Uh, oh, I, I, I think of uh, one night in particular where we were... Uh, the train was being shot at and we were laying down in the ditch in the snow and, <clears throat> and some somebody, I, I have no idea who he was, come along kicking everybody in the feet telling us to get those weapons fired, get those weapons going. Uh, but you're laying there in the snow and you're cold and you, you reach into a bandolier to get a clip of shells out and trying to get that into that M1, you know, and and you're shaking and you're scared. I don't know if you answered this, but you guys fought your way up the Chosen Reservoir and then back down? Yes, sir. Wow. Um. The going up wasn't near as difficult as coming back. What, what was the greater enemy to you guys, the, the cold or the Chinese? Oh, the Chinese. There was just thousands of them, thousands. Was it... Uh, was there any similarities between World War II and Korea as far as the fighting, or was it different? I, I would say there were some similarities, but generally, World War II, you were shooting at a hole in the ground, or a, or a space, or an area, as opposed to individuals. Because in Korea, you couldn't, you, when we were up in the north, you couldn't dig. <clears throat> you had to take cover behind something or, or behind rocks or in ditches or something like that. <clears throat> or at least World War II, we could dig foxholes. But, of course, like on Peleliu, and the Japanese had impregnated those coral ridges till, you know, they were three and four stories deep. And it was just almost, of course, that was another operation that was a, never should have been. Uh, it could have been bypassed. We were supposed to do it in three days. <clears throat> it took, uh, well, it took our regiment out of there after 10 days. We were non-functional. I was with the 1st Regiment at that time, Colonel Puller. And uh, they pulled us out after 10 days, but it went on another 24, 25 days after that. And that's a tube of five island. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it was, uh, the weaponry was a good deal the same, but can, can the I, cold was a terrible enemy to, to both sides. Can I ask a question? I've never been in combat, so I understand how I ask this, but is, is there something that happens to a, a person when they're faced with, with the enemy or their life's in danger? Do you become a different person, or are you, are you aware of your faculties and you're just... Boy, should I, you know, I mean, how, how did... Is it I think, that? basically, you're trying to uh, be a part of the group. 
you know, you, you operate. <clears throat> it was like when we were coming out up there. Oftentimes, you'd look around. And you, I didn't know a soul that was around me. But somebody would take a leadership role. And that was what was done. Uh, those, all of those people didn't go up there with the idea of being killed. They, they went up there with the idea of coming back and going home. Uh, but they found themselves in impossible conditions, and they get killed. Uh, granted, there, there are some that uh, found uh, the courage to do a lot of things that uh, I, I think you reach a certain point, and I know I, I've felt at times, well, there's no way I'm going to make it. So what difference does it make whether you get it <clears throat> the first day or the last day? I want you to uh, tell me the story about the Tootsie Rolls. <laughs> I can't remember where we got all the Tootsie Rolls. I think it was at Hagaroo But everybody had Tootsie Rolls. And, of course, you could put one of those in your mouth and Waller it around long enough and it'd give you some sugar, give you a little, little something. Uh, because it was just literally impossible. Uh, you, you tried, if you could get around a fire and try to melt enough snow to make a cup of coffee, uh, you know, you'd have smelled a lot of snow to make a cup of coffee if you were long, able to stay there long enough to do that. Uh, oftentimes we build fires with these shoe packs Why? We carried a pair of extra socks and a, and a liner <clears throat> underneath our belt in the hopes that at some point we can swap them out, have dry socks and dry liners. But every time <coughs> anybody get around a fire, you see them holding out socks and liners and stink. Oh my, <laughs> it, was <laughs> it was terrible. But it was, uh, it was like the warming tents I've seen. I was fortunate I never had crabs, but I saw men that did, and they would come into warming tents and strip down and pick crabs off and throw them on that oil burner, and they'd pop. <laughs> that was a big amusement factor. <laughs> it, uh, the, the food froze? The water froze? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You just eat snow uh, or try and melt some snow. Did the Chinese blow a bugle before they charged? Yes. Tell yeah. me about that. Bugles, flares, uh, all kinds of noisemakers. They were, they were great at it. They, they were, I know a lot of it was signals, but a lot of it was uh, psychological, too. And uh, they, uh, but they just, it seems, uh, I know, particularly as we were leaving, I can't remember where it was. It was south of, I think it was south of Coterie when we started to leave there. You could see off this mountain over here, and there was literally, it was just covered with Chinese coming over that mountain. They called airstrikes in on it. But it just didn't seem to, there were so many of them, it, they just kept coming, you know. You, the airstrike had hit, and there'd be a little hole there, but they just they just kept coming, and uh, there were there was just an an awful lot of them. Uh, Is it like an ant hill when you you mess up the ant hill? <laughs> pretty close, it? yeah, pretty close, yeah. yeah. But uh, I feel so fortunate. I I just because I very easily could have been. One of those corpses laying up there in North Korea that was never recovered. Uh, and <clears throat> I think of all those men that that happened to. And there are, you know, there's still something like 8,000 unaccounted for and missing in Korea. Uh, they have recovered some, but the North Koreans have not been cooperative about a lot of that at all. You know? You're thankful, and why, why do you think you survived and came back? Because God had wanted had something for me to do. I, I have no other answer after 
going through World War II, as fortunate as I was, and then Korea, I, I have no answer. I have no answer. Uh, World War II, maybe because I was so dumb, I was 16 years old, lied about my age, went in with, made, well, I was still 16 when we went in on Peleliu, went in on the second wave, and John Wayne wasn't there. <coughs> Found out it was serious. You grew up quick. Yes. Yep. Did you ever feel guilty for surviving some Oh, yes. How do you, how do you All the that? time. Really? How do, you do, how do you deal with that? I don't deal with it. I, I, I've tried desperately to put a lot of this out of my mind. Uh, I, <clears throat> for a while, I was active in the Chosen Few organization. But I found that the more I was around and talked about these things, the more they come back. And the more you start mulling them around. And, just like last night, I began to think about what I was going to say to you, uh, and it won't stop. And you, at some point, you have to begin to stop and forget it. Uh, and there's a lot of things I have forgotten, I know. Uh, when you get old, you start forgetting things, I guess. But, but I, I've really tried to forget a lot of them. And I've, uh, let me ask you this question, as far as remembering, do you think people are forgetting about World War II in Korea? Oh, definitely, definitely. I think a lot of people have no, no concept of them, any more than uh, how much of a concept do some people have about the Civil War and the horrible tragedies that took, case, you know, took place during that. It just, I, uh, I think it's just, the age and the time. I mean, Amy and, and people her age have uh, no concept of, of uh, what's happening. And I, I don't think anybody that hasn't been there can fully appreciate it. And uh, those that were, uh, I, I would just soon, you know, let it, let it lay for my own personal benefit. Do you think it's important that we do remember though? That oh yes, definitely. Why? Because there was a cost paid. There was a cost paid and it was paid for me, it was paid for my generation, for the next generation, for my kids, my grandkids, my great grandkids. And my only hope is that we don't have more of them <clears throat> that some of them have to go through. But I, I don't know if that'll ever happen. Well, that leads me to one of my final questions. Is what, what does freedom mean to you, Bill? <laughs> freedom is uh, the right to do what you feel is right as long as it doesn't infringe on you. In other words, my freedom stops at your nose. And... Uh, a lot of people don't understand that. They don't understand that, you know, there has to be a place for everybody. Because uh, if we don't stop before I get to somebody's nose, then we're going to have another war. And another one, and another one, and another one. Uh, but maybe that's humanity's, maybe that's their call. Tell me about the price for freedom. Well, <laughs> like the current day, I can't believe the money it is being spent. But that's irrelevant when it comes to the lives that are being spent. Anytime you have a war, you have the brightest, the leaders, the best, the cream of the crop that are out there doing the, what they can do because they feel obligated to do it. Uh, when I was called back to Korea, I went because I felt obligated to do it. Even though I had been in one war and didn't want to go to another one, but 
I felt obligated to do it, and I went ahead to do it. You, you make a commitment, you keep that commitment. And, that, and sometimes that commitment costs your life. But then uh, there's something beyond this. If there isn't, we're all in deep trouble. What does the American flag mean to you? <laughs> yeah, I, our church had a minister who didn't like to have the American flag in the church because she was afraid that we would give more allegiance to the American flag than we did to the Christian flag. Well, we went round and round and round about that. Uh, but finally she left, and the first thing I did was go down in the basement where the American flag was at and brought it up and put it in the sanctuary where it's been ever since. And not that we're always right. And uh, I look at a lot of things that go on in Washington, D.C., and uh, they, let me, they make a lot of mistakes, just like a lot of military leaders make mistakes. Mr. MacArthur was right a lot of times, other times he was wrong. What does it mean to you to have served your country? I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world, but I wouldn't want to go through it again for anything in the world. But it was a, a very awakening for me, particularly World War II. I, like I say, I, I lied about my, I barely turned 16 when I enlisted. I lied about my age. I coerced my dad into signing for me because he had no idea where I was going to be because I <coughs> run off. I <coughs> wasn't going to school. But suddenly you wake up and you find out, hey, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the camaraderie of the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps has always been one to <clears throat> try and bring out everything they can. They're dead, they're wounded, everybody. Uh, I, I don't like to denigrate or degrade other services, but I have seen instances in Korea in particular where uh, the leadership was not there, and it was very costly to units. But <clears throat> in the Marine Corps, the leadership was there. I always felt that I had good officers, good NCOs, who were fair, and they expect you to do what they're told. And I, I guess from boot camp on, you learn that. <laughs> and, and in combat, you depend on one another. Right, right. Which, that, that's the thing, you, you don't want to be undependable. You don't want anybody to fail to come to your aid if you need help. I think I know the answer, but do you consider yourself a hero? No. There's only, the only heroes are those that are still there that didn't come back, or the ones who are just grievously wounded. I saw a little blurb on the TV yesterday about a young man who had literally had this whole half of his head blown off in a rock. And fortunately, with the technology and things they have now, they, they're reconstructing that man's head. They give him a new skull. Uh, you know, it's amazing what they can do. Uh, these are the people that, you know, they've given so much, so much. Those who lost limbs, lost eyesight, or lost their mind, which happened a lot of times, or lost their soul. It's not a, it's not a matter of choice. I, I think you, <clears throat> uh, I don't know. It, we used to kid back and forth when we were in Korea and say, well, why don't we just, certain time we send a message over to the enemy and we say at such and such a time we're just going to pack up and go home because nobody wanted to be there but they were there and the fighting would boil down to a very very few people and it wouldn't take them long to get it over with but wars don't work that way they just don't seem to work that way 
I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. I hope it's okay for this. I do this at the end of my films, as, as you would watch the films. But I, I, w I would like you, from where you're at, to give me a salute into the camera when I tell you. Is that okay? All right. You do that? Okay. Okay, sir, right into the camera. Great. Thank you.